Hello everyone, welcome to another digital event by Disrupt Network. Today we've been discussed about a very interesting topic, role of public and private blockchains. The details of this event will be explained by our moderator, Saga, right after my quick introduction. So let's talk about one important event logistics. At this event is going to be big, everyone is going to be muted except for the speakers. If you have any question or suggestion during the talk, you can comment in the LinkedIn post or WhatsApp group that we have shared in the emails we send you. Or you can also just um, click in the QR code that I'm going to share shortly. Uh, we are a bit tight on time, so we won't be able to answer all the questions, uh, but we will try our best. Uh, that is from my side. I hope you enjoy the event today and learn more about the topic. I will now hand over to Saga to introduce about himself and all the speakers. Uh, welcome everyone uh, for the another panel event to discuss about like role of public and private blockchain. Before we start and introducing the start introducing the speakers, I would like to take opportunity to introduce about myself and about BlockRocket. And very briefly, like one or two minutes. So I'm Saga Barwalia, head of venture development at BlockRocket. We are like early stage startup investor and acceleration program based in Germany and all venture related activities I'm looking after at BlockRocket. So we started in 2019 to disrupt the German blockchain ecosystem when it comes to early stage startup, which means like a pre-seed and seed stage startups. We invest very early into the blockchain based startup, uh, but uh, we make sure that the startup have some kind of focus in German ecosystem and uh, they, they are like using blockchain as a niche solution to for their product. And uh, they should not be located into like Germany, but they should have like a German ecosystem highly in their mind. So we uh, we provide our startup like advisory and mentorship. We do like seed investment up to 250,000 euro in terms of ticket sizes. We also do like matchmaking and marketing. So as you heard of, it looks also similar to the other acceleration program like well-known like Y Combinator and Techstar but we are a very blockchain agnostic. So that means we are like highly relevant with the German ecosystem and we are focusing only on blockchain. So this is our partner network around the Europe and the globe. We are connected with the top blockchain projects, uh, infrastructure provider, VCs and other law firms. So normally we receive like 200 plus applications every year. We, we do like average like 150,000 euro ticket size investment in terms of like uh, ticket sizes. We do like five to 10 investment per year. We have like 250 plus partnership, as I said, based in dark region, and some of them are also located in Asia and Europe uh, and US market. We already have like 30 plus VCs in our network. That means like when the startup is looking for next funding round, we can already introduce to them to our partner VCs. We do every month like two to three events that makes like 25 plus events per year, basically to like uh, educate our like community when it comes to blockchain. So this is the team. If you are interested to get to know about us, what we are doing, what we do, and uh, if you would like to know more about like, then feel free to reach out to us. We are active on LinkedIn, Twitter. Apart from that, if your friends or family working from their garage and uh, working on the next big thing on the blockchain ecosystem, then feel free to refer to us. We are looking forward to deep dive into their business plan and investing to them. Great, so that's, that's all from my side. Now, uh, Moving further, I would like to ask each of the uh, speaker to introduce about themselves. Then we can start ladies first, right? So we have like Karen Ottoni. She is the director of ecosystem at Hyperledger. Welcome, Karen. Good to see you here. Please introduce about yourself. Hi, Sagar. Thank you. Very, um, how very um, polite of you. <laughs> um, so I'm Karen Ottoni. I'm director of ecosystem at Hyperledger. Um, I'm based in New York City, um, but Hyperledger and um, the Linux Foundation, which is the organization, the broader organization that Hyperledger is a part of, um, is uh, somewhat based in San Francisco, but really truly global. Our team is fully remote and global. We have um, team members in Europe and in Asia as well. Um, just to do a quick little mention on what Hyperledger is. Hyperledger is an open source software development community for enterprise blockchain. We have currently six different, uh, sorry, six, 16 different 
um, project code bases under Hyperledger. Um, a lot of times people have heard of one or the other. Um, uh, usually it's Hyperledger Indie or Fabric or Basu, um, but we actually have 16, six of them being distributed ledgers. So, um, and we're an open source community, so anyone can get involved, use our technology and participate in our community as well. And I look forward to talking more about that later. Thank you, Karan, for the wonderful introduction. Moving further, we have Regine from uh, IOTA. She is looking after market strategy and she is director at uh, market strategy for the IOTA Foundation. Regine, please introduce about yourself. Thank you very much, Sagar. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Regine Hashka Helmer. I'm very happy to join this panel today. Uh, I'm a director of market strategy of the IOTA Foundation. IOTA Foundation is a non for profit. Uh, organization based and registered in Berlin, but we have 150 colleagues now working in 23 countries, uh, and so we are working remote internationally. And um, as I said, uh, I'm director of market strategy and um, market adoption, and uh, so we are looking very much yeah, forward to our discussion today. Thank you, Regine. Uh, moving further, now we have like uh... Philip Brune, uh, he's a CTO and co-founder of SQ Solution. He's also a professor at Neu Ulm University of Applied Science. Please introduce about yourself. Yes, thanks a lot. Um, so as, uh, as, as I already said, I'm a professor for um, uh, business information systems engineering at Neu Ulm University of Applied Sciences in my main job. So my background is software development and uh, my uh, area or special area of expertise is, is enterprise computing and in particular in the financial services industry. Um, so uh, this is the background uh, from which I, I founded or co-founded uh, first uh, Quix and the Quix project, which is actually also open source. And then um, the uh, company SQ Solutions, which is a startup that is based in Frankfurt on the main uh, in, in Techquartier. So we are a German startup and uh, our goal is to really establish um, uh, blockchain as a technology for um, kind of uh, uh, helping to modernize financial services infrastructures in general. This is achieved by our own uh, blockchain framework called QuixChain. And on that, on top of that, we, we now uh, promote and, and um, offer the um, solution Squestity, which is actually targeting the market of um, asset managers and custodians. So uh, really in a, a very, very special uh, part of the financial services industry um, and, and asset management processes. And um, there we see a lot of potential for using blockchain as a, a technology for improving the reconciliation processes between the different parties. And um, that is uh, our, main, our main product. And as I said already before, um, with this combination between uh, the, the um, legacy systems and our uh, blockchain product, we are probably a very unique uh, company in that sense that we bring together these two worlds. We are also um, a business partner of IBM and um, uh, therefore uh, kind of related uh, with a traditional enterprise applications and modernization of mainframe and uh, using Linux for uh, kind of building these open source based solutions. So that is our, our mission. So we are also an open source based company. Thank you, Philip. Uh, moving further now, we have Hussein Kapasi uh, from PwC. He's leading the European blockchain. Uh, he's a Europe blockchain lead at PwC. Hussein, please introduce yourself. Thanks, Sagar. So, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Myself, Hussein Kapasi, I'm based in Munich, Germany. As Saga mentioned, I lead the PwC Europe blockchain community. So, we have more than 300 members you know, across the European country, which is divided you know, into two main areas around the crypto and the enterprise blockchain. And we have both different leads you know, leading those activity. And, and my role, what I get involved myself is on the enterprise blockchain side of it. So, how we really apply the blockchain technology in companies. And uh, I've been working in this space now almost three and a half years and uh, worked in more than nine industries, you know, how we can use blockchain along with different solutions uh, and not really replacing it. So that is what uh, I get myself involved and also do a lot of thought leadership, what's coming up next, you know, in the next five to 10 years, you know, and, and we also uh, work with um, more or less all the 
colleagues what we have here. So I'm, I'm really much looking forward, you know, uh, to understand how they uh, understand their perspective on the technology and how what is the role of, of public and private clubs. And so very much looking forward to the discussion. Sure, looking forward to it. And uh, I'm also excited to know like uh, which blockchain are you going to advise to your clients. But moving further, last but not least, we also have the David Vache, who is the lead for business development at Arthicoda. David, uh, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Saga. Thank you, everyone, for, for having us. And a bit of background on myself. I'm the venture development leader of R3. R3 is an enterprise blockchain firm. We initially started off as a consortium to discuss an idea on the concept of how we can use blockchain to make it usable and reliable for the world's leading banks. And since then, our enterprise distributed ledger technology platform, which is called Corda, has been developed as a result of that, offering privacy, security, scalability, and interoperability to serve those needs. So since then, we've expanded to various other industries, but industry-wide collaboration really remains at our core. So we run one of the world's largest blockchain ecosystems. We have about 400 plus now. So it's corporates, startups, regulators, cloud providers, and systems integrators all working together. And my role within venture development is to help early stage startup projects. So to find product market fit, get production ready fast, accelerate that go to market strategy and really find those customers and, and investors and be able to leverage that blockchain technology. So really, really looking forward to this discussion with the rest of the panel. Thank you, David, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, now, moving further, I would like to ask my first question to Karen. Uh, Karen, what, what are the main features or what type of differentiation does Hyperledger make use of compared to other protocols? Well, um, the first thing to understand about Hyperledger that I touched on in my intro is that we are not just one protocol, right? So we have um, six distributed ledgers, um, majority of which are general purpose modular ledgers. Um, so we have Hyperledger Fabric, you can build any type of use case on Hyperledger Fabric. We have Hyperledger Besu, similar. You can do all kinds of use cases there. Um, and then we have a few others like Hyperledger Roja and Burrow. Um, and then a, a more specific DLT based on digital identity, Hyperledger Indy. So um, what we are is we are a, an open source community that's building um, this open source software that each project is its own community and, um, and it's, ser you know, serving the needs of whatever that community is looking for in terms of operations and features and things like that. Um, and so, um, you know, I think in the very, in the early stages of enterprise blockchain, there was very much this like, uh, you know, Hyperledger versus Ethereum versus maybe even Corda. Um, and, you know, for us, we never really saw it as an either or type thing or a black and white type thing, um, because we have um, many, many different kinds of technologies that are part of our community. Um, several of our code bases are Ethereum based. Um, Besu is a, a permission version of Ethereum, so is Hyperledger Burrow. Um, and then we have independent DLTs too um, that are purpose built. So, um, you know, it really is about, um, you know, looking at what your use case is or looking at what language you're familiar with and using because some of they use different languages. Um, and so that's kind of where, where we see it. We don't really see it as a, um, a black and white either or um, anyone can really become a part of Hyperledger um, and contribute their code and make it an open source project. And then we would support it and try and grow that community. Sorry, I was moved. Thank you, Karen. Uh, I would like to ask the same question to David because as uh, Arthi Koda and like uh, Hyperledger is both are like a, a private blockchain. David, would you like to add something? Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more with with uh, with Karen's points there. And you know, tail end of last year, we in fact uh, had a, announced a partnership with IBM. So really for blockchain to really work, 
and for the industry to evolve, it has to go through that TCP IP moment of the internet where all protocols can interact together. And there's various different use cases, but the whole industry is growing. And, you know, the more we can, can work and collaborate together, the better that is obviously for our customers and, and for everyone who's, who's using this. So, yeah, with, you know, R3 specifically and Corda, we really set up within the financial services, but we tailor made it to all industry needs. So the purpose really is to just, what do enterprises need? And we found that that was to transact privately and directly without the need for intermediaries, but everybody needs to know who everybody is. So that's the premise that we went about, which is obviously very different from a public blockchain. And it's purpose built and the use cases are to support transactions between regulated entities to allow counterparties to be able to verify each other's identity. Again, an extremely important thing in business, which is maybe not so in, in various crypto transactions and public blockchain, to another to protect privacy by not broadcasting globally. We would very much do it on a need to know basis to enable the creation of legally enforceable contracts here. So there is like this concept of liability when, when things go wrong, we, we know where, where it's happened and to really be able to scale and support these consortia level industry transactions. So uh, certainly when you're broadcasting out to an entire network, scalability becomes an issue. So this is really the premise of what Corda was built and our vision behind that. And it's really for every industry of, uh, of, of where this is useful for, but it's very much an enterprise needed solution. Thank you, David. Uh, moving further, I would like to ask the same question to the Guinea because uh, now we ask, we talk about like a private blockchain. Then, what's the role of IOTA here? It's, it's like, why do we need like a public blockchain? Yeah, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, first of all, IOTA is not a blockchain, uh, it has a different architecture and idea behind. IOTA is using the Tangle architecture. That means we have no miners, we have no blocks. So, that means uh, IOTA. Uh, is uh, based on transactions and if you want to uh, get one transaction approved you need also to prove uh, two others so uh, iota the idea behind is that it will become more scalable the more participants you have in the network so um, and also therefore we don't need any miners it's a peer-to-peer -peer idea so participants uh, they also uh, yeah, do, do the work, you, you know. So uh, this is something which is totally different than from classical blockchain uh, ideas. This is the first differentiation. And uh, therefore, we don't need to pay miners. So IOTA is totally fee-less. That means you don't need to pay any miners. You don't need to pay any gas fees uh, for um, proving the transactions. So IOTA is totally fee-less. That's a, a huge uh, advantage, I would say, comparing to other uh, protocols. And uh, also the energy consumption is very low. So because, you, you know, we don't need to have these mining farms, we don't need to generate blocks and so on. And therefore the energy consumption is really low. And uh, IOTA is um, open and we believe in permissionless innovation, of course, but it depends very much on the use case, you know. When you have some use cases, when it comes, for instance, like supply chain, tracking, whatever, uh, sometimes it really makes sense to have like a, a permission network where you decide who participates in this network. And so IOTA is like hybrid. You can have per, uh, permission tangles, which are more private. And, but you also have the permissionless tangle where you can connect uh, the, the private tangles too. That means, so it depends totally on the, on the use cases, on the demand of the industry, because we are working very closely with the industries, with a lot of uh, partners there and companies. And so we also see these demands are coming from the market. So I think it depends really on the use case, what kind of use case you want to bring into the market. And therefore we have the both combination. Yeah, and of course, uh, IOTA is 100% uh, open source, of course, and, uh, yeah, so I think this is the differentiation. No That's blockchain. Right. It's a distributed ledger. We call it dark directed acyclic graph. Yeah. Understood. Thank you, uh, Regine. Uh, so moving further, uh, I would like to ask Philip. I mean, there are like so many solutions available in the market. Why yeah. did you like uh, invent your own blockchain at yes, Solution? Yes. 
Yeah, that's a good that's a good question, and of course, that's uh, I think an important question because um, the the frameworks that that have been presented, uh, Hyperledger and and um, and Corda, of course, are kind of frameworks. They are blockchain um, libraries that you can use to to build your own solutions on top of that. Um, our approach is a bit more focused. So what what uh, what we are uh, we are we are not offering a really generic uh, framework. I mean, we're offering a framework and our base technology is open source as well, but um, it is not intended uh, as a kind of to become, to become an independent framework like, like Lacorda, for example. Um, our approach is to, to build a solution that is usable in, in certain business scenarios. And that is uh, really uh, targeted to be, to be really maintainable and, and run by banks, especially by banks and, and, and insurances and so on in, in a, um, uh, using technologies that, that they actually have. So in the, in the core enterprise application space, there, you have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, COBOL applications still around. And then you have, of course, uh, Java as an as important language, Java EE. And our blockchain basis, or to, to be honest, uh, to, to, to uh, refer to what Regine said, also, also QuickChain is, is more like a, it's a distributed ledger. Um, and it's, it's not... Um, exactly a chain so that that uh, people call it a blockchain but it's like like iota is called a blockchain but it's technically probably more close to to iota uh, to, uh, regarding the structure of the of the records and um that is uh, actually also intended and and the, the idea was to build a, a solution from the ground up that is really targeted to to the needs to be really highly integrable in, in in the core enterprise system so we are not intending to to build a new technology that runs kind of as a independent systems separate from kind of classical banking IT operations but something that can be really plugged in there and is really maintainable by the people they have so that typically they have Java developers or they're, they're consultants of Java developers so we are, we are avoiding these kind of fancy new languages like Go and, and Kotlin and, and the others that are now kind of uh, um, uh, spreading everywhere, every company is creating its own language, uh, Swift and whatever you call it. And um, we are focusing on the traditional enterprise technologies to make it really integratable, to make it really maintainable, to make it really uh, trusted and, and using highly kind of established technologies. And uh, so that is a bit, a bit of difference. So probably our solution is something that is kind of taking the best out of Coda and Yota and, and the other approaches, but really boiling it down to a very, a very efficient, small, and compact uh, solution that use, we use as a foundation for, for our products custody. And um, therefore, of course, we keep interoperability. It's, it's easy to integrate with other protocols. And we can also maybe, uh, one plan is to use, for example, Hyperledger Bezu for the, uh, for the Ethereum integration or something like that. So that, that can be done because it's also Java. Um, but um, we, we, so we are, of course, we remain open, as, as the colleague said, that's an important point, but um, we want to, to give the customers a really uh, kind of experience and, and technologies that will, will be reliable for a long time in the future and avoid this kind of, uh, um, this zoo of, of new languages that will run into a, a maintenance problem soon. So uh, I'm quite sure that this kind of, uh, trend at the moment to create new languages everywhere will, will, will lead to the next skill gap in a few years and, and be a threat for, for, for companies. So that, that is actually something we wanted to avoid to really uh, get the customers there where they are at the moment. So that, that's the reason for that. For that one. So it's, it's, not, it's not intended to be a big competition to Corda or something. It's intended to be a solution that is tailor-made for the customers for that situation. Thank you, Philip. Uh, moving further, I would like to ask Hussein now, uh, if we heard all uh, like four of the speakers, so which solution are you going to use for your clients? Yeah, so as I, as I mentioned, I mean, already Karen and uh, David highlighted a little bit on that. There is no black and white solution, right? Yeah. So how we normally go as a consultants, right? So we really start um, with a business problem. What is really the business problem we are solving? and then keeping in, in really the core characteristics at mind, right? So why they are using blockchain. And one of, the, one of the topics why we use blockchain is really the decentralization, right? I mean, because I'm especially focusing on supply chain and operations, right? We have different areas like manufacturing, you know, procurement, supply chain and logistics. So we really see, okay, where it makes sense to use a typically blockchain solution. And I mean, there is 
uh, no one platform which we can say, okay, this is really the best platform. Right? And, and I mean, uh, I, I would like to record, you know, what David highlighted. We are in a stage of, you know, internet in 1997, where there was being a discussion, you know, VPN versus the internet protocol, right? So there is today, we are using both. We are using VPN in the companies and also internet simultaneously and seamlessly. And I mean, the discussion between the public and private would be in, in the same way. And, and let me quote you an example where we use all the platforms, what we are having in this panel discussion, right? So for example, for procurement or, or really the trade finance part, I mean, R3 Coda is really having a very sweet spot. I mean, there are a number of applications being developed over there. In manufacturing, you know, especially for the machine to machine communication, IOTA has really come good applications over there. And Hyperledger has really some good solutions or application being developed as, as also Philip mentioned, you know, they, they provide a really good framework for some of the supply chain applications. So when we look at really the business problem, we map out, okay, what are really the best solutions out there in the market because no company wants to reinvent the wheel, you know, especially when the know-how and the tech capabilities are very limited, you know, so we see how uh, we can make the best use of it, what is available. And um, I mean, I would like to use a now a keyword, you know, which is now interoperability. So in future, I mean, we need to see, you know, which platform champions in which area, and then how we can stitch, uh, you know, all this together. So, I mean, that is really going to be the future rather than, you know, championing and, and saying, okay, this is really the best solution or, you know, for private or blockchain solution, which is best for the industry. And, and, and this is how the market will evolve uh, in the next five years. And, and I mean, the APIs, how we develop, you know, between the software solution, there would be interoperable solutions and, uh, and um, packages also, whatever we call it as a kids, you know, will be developed uh, where we really stitch um, those applications. I mean, Philip highlighted, you know, that is a very special example that these are, this is how, you know, industry specific solutions will be developed, you know, and this is, uh, this is how the complete market landscape in the next five to 10 years um, will, will evolve. Yeah. Thank you. And now moving further, I would like to ask Karen, uh, Karen, uh, if you can uh, tell us like top, three to four use cases uh, of the hyperledger and the real use cases, if you would like to explain. You're, you're mute, Karen. Newbie <laughs> on Zoom, like we haven't been on this all year long. Um, uh, thank you. So um, I could keep you here all day talking about the use cases that we have on hyperledger. We actually just, finished our annual Hyperledger Global Forum. It was a virtual event um, with over 1,400 people registered at the beginning of June. Um, there were more than 100 talks uh, during those three days that we had our event. So um, I'll touch on a few examples, but um, if you're really interested, uh, go to our YouTube page of a whole playlist with all the sessions recorded from that event. Um, but, you know, well, as uh, I think Hussein mentioned, um, he's been working on a lot of supply chain. Supply chain has certainly been um, an area where we've seen a lot of use cases. You may know about um, the uh, Walmart food trust example, um, trade finance as well. We also have the um, Maersk, uh, Maersk led, we dot trade. Um, so there's a lot that's been happening in that industry. And, um, you know, we have case studies on our websites that detail more about those if you want to learn more. But, um, you know, people, have, we, I think people know very much the supply chain use case. You know, you've got a lot of different actors um, all along a different route. There's lots of documentation needed, verification, lots of um, exchange of value, et cetera. Um, and so it's a very good use case for blockchain. Um, but what I'd love to touch on more is, you know, some of the new stuff that we're seeing. There's a lot of other applications for um, blockchain technology that's using Hyperledger. Um, for example, the hot topic of CBDCs, um, we're seeing Hyperledger uh, Besu Fabric and Hyperledger Eroha being used um, in various jurisdictions. Eroha is currently operating a, a payments network with the Bank of Cambodia called Project Bakong. Um, Besu is being used in Thailand. Um, Fabric is currently being used right now in a live CBDC, one of the only live CBDCs in the world um, with the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. 
um, and, and, and many others that are in pilots as well that have not been launched. So that's an exciting area where we're seeing um, uh, new use cases. Um, to shift gears again, um, we're seeing also a lot of examples in telecom. So we have um, Verizon is using um, <clears throat> Hyperledger for dispute management. Um, in uh, several examples in India with telecom as well um, to scale 5G um, uh, and 4G LTE and 5G, um, giving access to the next billion people to access telecom services. Um, we also have seen uh, examples with Telefonica, which is a member of Hyperledger. Um, so there's a lot of go a lot going on in the telecom industry. We have a number of special interest groups at Hyperledger. Um, these are interest groups that align along different industries. They're open for anyone to join. You can find them on our wiki, wiki.hyperledger.org. So for example, we have one on telecom and that's where a lot of the discussion about those use cases happen. Um, uh, you know, lessons learned, people share, do a lot of presentations on, on what they've built and the challenges that they overcame. Um, so I encourage anyone interested to get involved, but we have others in, in other industries too. So another exciting um, area of use cases is in media and entertainment. Um, you know, we've seen the proliferation in the past year of NFTs, um, and often, um, you know, NFTs are using public blockchains, but there's actually also a lot of usage that's happening with the more permissioned um, uh, private blockchains as well. So, um, like I said, I could keep you here all day <laughs> if you wanted to hear all the, all the different kinds of use cases um, that are being used with, with Hyperledger technologies. Thank you, Karen. Uh, moving further, my next question to Tawid. What are the core use cases for Coda? Who is using your solutions? Yeah, thank you. And yeah, I, I guess it's also emphasized what many of the, the panel said, Corda is itself, again, fully open source and not a blockchain, a distributed ledger with, again, the, the core parts of the key distinction being that it's not broadcast to every, everybody and there's no blocks created. So really the industries that we're focusing on and very much like Karen said, it can be applicable to, to all manner of them, but focusing on the real core parts of, of quarter of how it was purpose built was for highly regulated industries. So if we focus on banking and financial services, that, that industry is four times more heavily regulated than the pharmaceutical industry, which seems amazing, but true. And, you know, within that quarter is allowing banks to transform cross-border payments. It allows treasury management with digital assets. You can streamline client onboarding with, collaborative KYC and AML solutions. And again, you can construct these future payment rails that would obviously align with CBDC as well as all the, the wallets, personal wallets and digital wallet use cases that are coming up. So partners there, you know, including Wells Fargo, MasterCard, DTCC, the, the Swiss Digital Exchange, NASDAQ, along with the, the central banks and regulators that re leverage this. The, the best example here really being 90% of the Italian banks. So I believe that's around 100 are, are leveraging Corda for interbank reconciliations between them. So that's live in production with, a, I think, over 350 million transactions have gone through in, in the past six months. So you know, a, a big use case. Then another vertical will be an insurance where quarter really addresses that end-to-end -end issues facing insurers because the entire ecosystem has to streamline operations and that allows you obviously to lower cost and expense ratios but also at the same time make claims more, more verifiable so the whole end-to-end -end automation allows one the cost saving element the, the more efficient processing and then new product offerings for customers so the b3i consortium there which is 21 insurance market participants around the world and has over 40 companies is, is a is a quarter user and they actually switched the quarter in 2018 and that's where most of the insurance customers interact and finally as Hussein mentioned the the trade finance it's just as an industry, it just remains so opaque and fragmented. It's heavily dominated with paper processing, like a lot of manual processes, 
and a lot of different participants along the transaction life cycle. So that involves banks, importers, exporters, you've got uh, credit agencies, you've got cardo holders, so that there's a lot of costs as well as operational risks. And having a permission blockchain there to be able to identify parties to simplify and manage the process and digitize the, the, the entire value chain is obviously beneficial. So you know, Marco Polo, Contour, DTCC being, being prime examples, uh, DLT ledgers being prime examples of, of customers using Corda there. Thank you, David. Uh, moving further, I would like to ask Philip. Philip, yes. where do we see the real use cases of blockchain within the next five to 10 years and how SQ solution can also contribute to this ecosystem? Oh, yes. So um, it's an interesting question. So of course, we, we, we also thought, okay, what, what, what we could provide, what, what others can't do and what, what is not there already. And um, if, you, if you're moving around in this blockchain uh, community for a while, you see that, that there are most startups are always repeating the same ideas again. So it's trade finance. There are many startups I know that, that are somehow in trade finance. And there's also, of course, uh, supply chain is a very natural example. That is what Hyperledger and IBM also promoted very early. So um, that, these are the kind of obvious use cases. And, and I think always many, many uh, try to kind of follow this, this kind of... Uh, straight path that everybody else is doing. So, of course, we did not want to do it again, and that doesn't make sense to, to be another, or payments, of course, uh, payment, be it interbank or B2B payments, or be it, of course, public payments with the crypto space and to tokenization is a big thing in, in the public blockchain space. <laughs> But, but that's not actually not our business. And uh, what I'm interested in are the use cases that might be a bit more sustainable and more uh, closer to the core processes of the organizations. Uh, that what, what uh, was said already by David before, that, that we, we are looking for, for the financial services industry, which is highly regulated, but also has a lot of processes which are still very, very paper-based, very, very manual, very um, uh, kind of, of arcane and, and, and archaic in, 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 its, in its way. And also a lot of old systems that are not really uh, interoperable and, and are kind of uh, doing batch processing for, for many things and so on. So there are many, many uh, problems. And on the other hand, the industry is highly regulated and also um, is under pressure by digitalization and, and being, improving and speeding up that processes. So I think that is an area that is really uh, kind of uh, very interesting for, for blockchain applications. It really makes sense because in the early years, a lot of blockchain applications have been made that if you want, would, would be kind of really looking at seriously, you would say, okay, you did, would not really need a blockchain for that because you have maybe a central authority or a central party or anyone who could offer a processing system on a centralized way. So um, I think for, for really distributed scenarios where we have really a, a need and a, a, a kind of a valid use case, it's, it's the financial services industry still offers a lot of potential. And we are focusing really on a on a very niche problem, namely, namely to, to use blockchain to, um, to optimize intra-bank and inter-bank or inter-party uh, processes that are currently still to a high degree manual or relying on sending around email sheets, Excel sheets with email and so on, uh, which is this process between um, capital management or asset management companies and the custodian banks and, and uh, some of the additional parties like brokerage and so on that's involved there. And um, uh, we are not focusing here on, on crypto assets or tokenized assets mainly, but on, on classical processes. So blockchain as a means to, to really modernize the process uh, support or the process handling in companies, in the financial services companies. That is our niche and our, our goal that we are, are looking for, especially uh, being open to, of course, to other things. But I think in general, um, we are trying to make a, uh, address a use case that is valid, which we know from our own business experience and also from a lot of discussions with, with people from the industry. And um, on the other hand, that is not really the focus of many uh, of the kind of more popular blockchain approaches or frameworks that, that we have. And of course, we are open and interoperable. So I see for the, for the next five to 10 years, I think uh, there will be consolidation. I think we will see that blockchain will be used for those cases where it makes sense. Uh, that these, all these uh, competition that is now in some areas will vanish that there will be a consolidation of, 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 of solutions and companies and so on. And uh, like, like it was in the other, uh, you know, in the internet as, as, as uh, 
is in mentioned before um, that, that the 10 years ago 20 years ago in the 90s we had these discussions with the internet industry and now of course um, interoperability i think is a big it's a big issue uh, and even though there are many te different technical implementations we will kind of see that that uh, we will be able to kind of use this, uh, the various protocols for the and it be interoperable between the protocols I, I'm, I'm convinced of that and um, of course, there will be kind of a consolidation in the solutions as well. And so I think to have a good use case that is actually really valid and, and, and is promising and will, will create value for the companies in their core business, not, not with a startup uh, incubator space sandbox front end thing that might be nice and, and popular, but really creating a value for, to, to, to help the banks to, to modernize their core business processes and that I think is, is what uh, what we are working on and, and that will be I think uh, a big a big uh, market for, for in the future. Thank you Philip. Now uh, I would like to ask the same question to also Regine. Regine what what are the like how big is your ecosystem? What are the real use cases or like applications getting built on IOTA? Yeah, <clears throat> IOTA started with the uh, vision of the machine economy when we envision a future where uh, uh, everything is connected. You know, we have the IoT devices, we have connected cars, and uh, machines are participating in our economy. So we will have more autonomous agents, will, uh, which will also uh, do transactions and participate in our economy. This was the starting vision of IOTA. So, of course, we are working in this field in IoT and Industry 4.0. So, are we, we are working a lot with uh, companies in this field in mobility, Industry 4.0, when it comes to like oil trails and all these things. But now we are uh, working across industry with uh, also supply chain, with uh, in mobility area, we are have a strong focus right now. We are working with um, Dell and Intel when it comes to uh, make sure where the data comes from, data uh, fabric to where we can really work on the, the build the trust in the data source, which is key for every new applications. And IOTA, you also can just purely do data transactions without any value transaction. This is very unique. So if you want to participate in the IOTA um, transaction network, you don't need to own crypto, you, you don't need to uh, transact any values, it's purely data transactions. So it enables a lot of more use cases and participants in the data uh, network uh, of IOTA. And uh, also when I, I think about the future, uh, when everything will be much more connected. So I think it, it's very important that uh, we have 100% uh, trust in data. Mm. So. Uh, IOTA is, is uh, there very strong when you need, of course, um, um, yeah, the trust in data where it's really needed. And uh, so also, of course, IOTA is relevant for uh, highly regulated industries as well, not only for the, for the, the IoT, where you also, of course, when it comes to security, you need, of course, 100% uh, yeah, trust in the data where it comes from when it comes to connecting machines with each other. and, and decision making between machines, of course. So I think this is also very important where IOTA is uh, working. And now we are adding to the IOTA application layer also smart contracts that enables much more use cases in the future. So also what we are doing now is we're working very closely with uh, the industry for, um, for instance, like the vaccination passports, where you have this uh, open network where participants can uh, put in the data when it comes to vaccination. And so it's an international network. We are working with Zebra technologies on that, for instance. And um, so we have crossover, cross industry, a lot of use cases and uh, we are working on digital twin uh, models and use cases together with the mobility industry. We are working on decentralized marketplaces because they are very interesting and very uh, they are valuable when it comes to data um, yeah, transactions and data uh, exchanges in the future where people can, um, yeah, they, they own their own data, they can sell the data. And um, so uh, I think this is also very important for the future that we have more of these kind of decentralized marketplaces for such services and solutions. Thank you, Regine. Uh, my next question goes to Hussein. Hussein, how can we address the challenges of blockchain Iceland being developed, right? And 
to the tend toward like public blockchain or private blockchain and what do you think which blockchain will ultimately prevail so as as i mentioned before right so i mean there is uh, no right and wrong over here and the only only solution over here is here is interoperability you know so um, i mean this is still a very new topic so normally we we you know in, in the start of the year we think okay what are the topics which is going to be addressed you know this year by the company and we thought interoperability is the number one topic and in now we are six months or seven months down the line and um, i mean all the big banner companies are you know approached us to tackle those uh, to t- tackle the problem of interoperability i mean this is coming very quick and and you know very fast uh, especially and as as a uh, some of our colleagues here highlighted i mean every solution we need to ultimately solve a problem right uh, blockchain is just a, a technology behind the curtain and um, which step I, whether you see like private or block uh, private or public blockchain i mean it doesn't matter which problem you are solving really matters to the company and how you are monetizing that either cost saving or revenue models and so on so i mean interoperability would be a topic you know which will touch different aspects of it and interoperability between blockchain is one topic but there are certain aspects of it right you need to also think about interoperability between the legacy system yeah. you know it's not only about you know blockchain yeah. to blockchain because that's only most of yeah. the people think about it between the legacy systems right also most of the time governance is one topic right so governance because we have different type of blockchain platforms i mean governance always think about blockchain governance but if you see blockchain is a team sport we need to think how many players are you know participating we need to think about the ecosystem governance i mean i have never heard on this topic till now and i mean this has these are the topics you know which will be addressed in the next 2 to 3 years which will solve this problem and i mean there are some thought leadership coming also from world economic forum and i mean you might have seen that you know they they are really trying to bring and address the solution and also standardization in the solution because i mean there are already some solutions out there in the terms of interoperability and so on i mean again i i think this was a question raised or uh, addressed or uh, answered by philip but in terms of interoperability also there are two aspects one is really about the information document sharing you know validation and whatever we do in the blockchain space this is all how we interoperate between the blockchain and then there is a secondary aspect is tokenization like how you also enable interoperability of tokens between the ecosystems and i mean these are really the topics which will you know enable the seamless uh, working of different platforms um in the system and i mean most of the company today when we go and on talk about for example tokenization you know they say okay this is really the topic for the future but and then we have seen also the companies where they say okay private or blockchain they are comfortable because it's it's you know it's in the they have the control over there but then there is a question of decentralization so if you really see uh, really the definition of blockchain decentralization tokenization is core of it you know otherwise the blockchain solution is not complete you know it's still the blockchain inspired solution not really the blockchain complete solution i would say so i mean it will go in the direction and i mean this is really the way we will solve this uh, blockchain island problem yeah thank you usen now uh, i would like to i mean there are lots of things to discuss and we are running out of time unfortunately so i would like to ask one more question which is like uh, ongoing on topic about esg right everyone is talking about esg uh, so i would like to ask current what is your opinion on esg and second question is like uh, the role of female in blockchain space in general um before i touch on that i just want to kind of jump off of what husen was saying on interoperability because we've actually had a couple of new um labs come into hyperledger that are focused on interoperability that if anyone's interested i want to draw your attention to um uh we already had the hyperledger cactus project which is one of the tools in our ecosystem that helps uh promote the integration between ledgers but we've just recently had some contributions um one called uh, a weaver and yui u i y u i um and they're both in the hyperledger labs and they both focus on interoperability so that could be something interesting if anyone's wanting to explore and then um our team is actually also helping the world economic economic forum with one of their papers on interoperability there's the um dc gc which is the digital currency initiative at wef um and Brian Bellendorf and I are both working on the interoperability paper that they're going to be releasing later this year 
uh, for, for specifically related to CBDCs and stable coins. Um, and what the, because there's a lot of questions around that, there's a lot of uh, research um, and debate on that. And so we're trying to bring some definitions to the different things um, being discussed in that space. In terms of ESG and diversity, that's kind of lumping two really big things together. Um, but um, Hyperledger is focused on diversity and inclusion. Um, at our recent global forum, we um, did a number of things to help promote further diversity and inclusion by ensuring that there were no all male panels. Um, uh, we also had some programming related to involving um, support for parents who are taking care of their kids here during the pandemic while, while trying to attend an event. We had some programming for children during the event so that they could um, focus on, uh, on the keynotes. Um, we have a diversity inclusion working group, et cetera. So it's something that's really um, core to what we're trying to promote and, um, and bring just, you know, more diversity into the space because um, it, as an ethos of open source, right, the more eyes on uh, the code, the better, more, the stronger the code is. So the more people that are involved, the more diverse everyone's backgrounds, the stronger the community will be. In terms of ESG, um, there's a lot, a lot of interest and a lot going on um, in that as well. We have a climate action special interest group that's very active. Um, they are um, uh, writing up different blogs and papers, um, discussing all kinds of different use cases for uh, and having presentations on companies that are using blockchain to do um, carbon capture capture, um, trying to track carbon emissions. So um, there's a vibrant discussion of that happening in our community as well. And I encourage you to um, check that out at our wiki.hyperledger.org too. Uh, thank you, Karen. Uh, I would like to also ask the same question to each individual speaker, but please make it short because we are running out of time. So I will start with Philip, then yes. we'll move on there. Yeah, maybe two remarks. Uh, first of all, of course, regarding um, ESG and, and ecological uh, aspects. So of course, as a company, we are highly committed to these, these goals. And um, I mean, we are a very small company, so our uh, impact or our possibilities are somehow limited, of course, to, to uh, really execute these things in, in all dimensions, because I mean, we don't have an office that we can uh, kind of heat uh, ecological or something so um, but nevertheless um, we are we are focusing on that and we try to uh, to to focus that and regarding diversity I think that's a, that's a very very important point as we have uh, in, in in general um, I think uh, we, we as a company we are growing at the moment and we are looking for new new talents and, and new new colleagues and therefore um, of course we uh, we are highly uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, encouraging everyone, especially of course, uh, uh, diverse people with a diverse background to apply because we, we want to, to get more diverse, of course. And we also have now the first uh, colleague, female colleague as a developer, but this is uh, something that, that needs to grow in the next years as we are very early stage startup. Um, regarding ecological things, I think uh, one, one important remark um, is about energy consumption of, of, uh, of course, we are not a public blockchain, so there is no mining, but I think energy consumption is a, an issue that is underrated in the, in the whole internet economy and in the cloud discussion typically because um, uh, yeah, it, at the moment energy is, is still too, too cheap in, a, in a, to some respect uh, to, to be an important factor, but um, I think that uh, this will become more important in the, in the, in the future. And um, what we are doing is we are really uh, running our solutions or we are uh, testing our solutions on, the, on these uh, IBM Linux One machines, which is uh, a very highly scalable uh, single system. So not horizontal, but vertical scaling. And it has a very, very uh, efficient energy footprint if the system is really uh, uh, run on a, on a, to, a, to a high level, uh, in a high utilization level. And that is something that I think uh, will become more important in the future. And where we are kind of uh, collaborating also with IBM to, to, uh, to make it uh, possible to offer it on their cloud platforms, which are more en energy efficient in that sense than, than for example, an Intel-based uh, Amazon or Azure or whatever uh, uh, server farm. Uh, so that, that is something that uh, I think has, has some impact and, and is something that is typically not really 
in the focus of the discussion and typically today it's because energy is obviously not not the big cost factor but or you know, not enough expensive to to make it the factor to that respect but um, i think we as a company that looking to the future are also thinking about these things so esg is important yes to to maybe try to to establish practices uh, in all to all to all dimensions in in our company to uh, to to uh, really uh, enforce that and to to grow uh, regardless thank you. thank thank you philip uh, i would like to ask the same question to david uh, hussein and regina so we'll start with david uh, please make sure you keep it short yeah thank you yeah i'll keep it very short on diversity and inclusion we have a committee internally so people are held accountable to that it's very important for our three it's always been our ethos and we we have a team responsible for that so we make that one of our core values on esg Again, it's just worth taking a step back. I know we obviously as a panel and, and in a space talk about this quite a lot, but for the benefits of everybody maybe new to this, you know, the uh, going back to the original Bitcoin white paper, the purpose of what Bitcoin was designed to do was provide cryptographic proof that a transfer of value has happened between two peers without the need for a central intermediary. So calling it cryptocurrency first is a bit of a misnomer. It's really designed not to replace a dollar, but it's actually designed to replace the financial system. You don't need that intermediary anymore, but what you need to provide that cryptographic proof is a consumption of a very large amount of energy, increasingly so, to make this more secure. So that is a very big thing for Bitcoin, but as we've mentioned in this panel, most other newer technologies and most newer protocols which use proof of stake do not require this. They're not proof of work and they don't need this, number one. Then number two, many of the concepts we're talking about here with private ledgers use a distributed ledger, which is peer-to-peer, -peer, does not broadcast and does not require any mining. So in fact, ESG is, is barely even an issue. It's very important for our customers, but as far as the energy consumption of what our protocols use, it's actually minimal. It's actually just purely a big thing for Bitcoin. And that's why it gets so much air time. Thank you, David. Uh, moving further, Hussein, uh, would you like to add yeah. something? Yes, of course. I mean, for us, uh, sustainability is one of the biggest topic. We also see that trend. And I myself was involved uh, in a strategy project for one of the biggest manufacturers in the world. Uh, so I spent two months on this and, and really defining what is sustainability in, and deal with blockchain. And, and we classified in two major areas. One is really how we reduce waste or manage the waste all around the cycling, uh, plastic recycling and all those stuff and traceability of that, right? This is where blockchain plays a major role. And there are a number of applications, right? But that is one category where we call it, you know, managing the waste or reducing the waste. And the second one is all around CO2 emissions, right? Be it uh, uh, tokenizing the people if they use the green options or, you know, managing the CO2 footprint, exchanging CO2 tokens directly in the ecosystem or the industry. I mean, we can speak on the use cases full day but i mean these are really the two main areas you know where companies will focus and is focusing now uh, and how we deal with that is a separate topic and in terms of again the diversity i mean um, in pwc germany itself is few thousand people and i mean we are, we are really increasing the female leadership and also with different levels i mean it's really growing and then also for example we have blockchain special interest groups in our community and i mean um, 30 percent of the social interest groups are driven by the female uh, leadership teams i mean and, and still growing so this is uh, this is where we stand Thank you. I would also like to ask each of the speaker if you would like to share your LinkedIn uh, link uh, in the chat box below so the people can connect you with. And also, as I said, like for the audience, Philip is looking for young talent. So if you're looking for full time job in blockchain mm -hmm. space, then reach out to SQ Solution or like also the other speakers. I think I'm reading like uh, also the articles from David and Hussein. So quite interesting. So please uh, add them on LinkedIn. Uh, they will show, uh, share it the chat. And going further, uh, I would like to also ask the same question to Regine, uh, if you would like to add something on ESG topic. Uh, yeah, uh, also we uh, we uh, are, we don't have any miners, we are not creating blocks, so IOTA is a green technology, so it's very important, but um, I, we consider ourselves as a green technology, and uh, we are working very closely uh, on a lot of use cases when it comes to sustainability and climate tech. So we are working on a digital MRV project with the government in Canada right now in the use case to, uh, to, to bring that into the market. 
because it's really important for us and diversity. We have an internal and external program for diversity. And so we are donating 1000 developer courses uh, to women. So uh, we are very active. Also, we are hosting a co-chair in Inatpa when it comes to diversity. So it's also in our core values and very important for us. Thank you, Regine. Thanks a lot, all of the speakers. Uh, I really appreciate you took time and come to our panel event. And I think it was really wonderful discussion. Uh, there's a lot of lots of things to discuss, but we cannot unfortunately discuss everything in one hour. So uh, thanks a lot once again. And as always, I would like to hand over to Alexandra from Disrupt Network as uh, the last word goes to the Disrupt Network. Um, yes. Thank you, Saga, and all the speakers for joining the event today. Um, for all the event participants, um, thank you for joining. You can scan the QR code to join the WhatsApp group if you haven't done so, so you can continue exchanging about enterprise blockchain. And um, the speakers, of course, you're welcome to join too uh, to connect with uh, attendees. Um, I'm hoping to see you in our next event. Goodbye.